part of the TV9 Canada Summit and we are going to talk about the growth story of Karnataka, the unique role which Karnataka plays in India's growth story. It contributes more than 8% to India's GDP. Uh, state is a success story. Bangalore is one of the world capitals. If you can talk about Shanghai, you can also talk about Bangalore, but Bangalore will have its own issues. But the fact of the matter is, it's out there. So, on this note, I would welcome Krishna Bhairagora, the Revenue Minister in the Karnataka government. So, let me begin this. Thank you so much, Krishna. Thank you for making time. Uh, and let me uh, begin this interview by asking you, as a Revenue Minister, when you took up the department, what did you inherit? So, <laughs> first of all, a clarification. Uh, in at least the context of Karnataka, the revenue mostly deals with land resources. So, we deal with land resource management, uh, property management, uh, transaction of properties. So, there is a small revenue stream, no doubt, but I, I, I majority of the financial revenues are with the finance department. I deal with only a part of the revenue, uh, financial revenue, and I also deal with some GST matters as an extra responsibility not related to revenue. Uh, but uh, primarily, my challenge is land resources are a high potential economic asset. Um, they are a very productive asset, but due to historical uh, uh, lacuna in land management of records, transactions. Uh, now this very highly productive asset has uh, become a bit, uh, you know, uh, boxed up, uh, become sh uh, uh, shackled a bit. So my challenge is to how to ensure that the land resource documents are perfect so that this asset can be unlocked to realize its full potential and it becomes a very robust productive asset which can enhance the overall economic growth in my state. You know, so this is the challenge. You know, Krishna, I must say that land is not a, a small issue. A yeah. major part of the problem which Manipur is facing yeah. is also because of the issue of land, the yes. perception of its use, the yes. colonization, the debate on foreigners being there. Yeah and who gets to owe land, which part of it. I yeah. think in future, yeah. uh, unlocking of land is yeah. going to be very important yeah. for uh, spurring economic activity. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, we look at land uh, from an agricultural point of view. Uh, it may not be high economic value, but it is essential to nat nation's uh, survival and prosperity uh, because of the food security angle. Number two, uh, agriculture caters to 40-45% of our employment. Uh, it may not be highly productive, but in terms of its employment impact on the country, it is the most critical sector. So as a result, management of land resources uh, becomes very critical to a state's economy, to a nation's economy. And there are a lot of historical legacy issues plaguing the land management. And if we can work out a good system of land management, uh, ownership, title, transaction, transfer, and uh, bring surety to it, security to it, then we can further enhance the economic productivity of land. So, and also we can deal with otherwise, you are, you are giving the most extreme example of Manipur, but on a day-to-day -day issues, lack of clarity on land title leads to daily skirmishes in a village. And they are micro battles taking place in a village level because the land title is not clear. Two people are getting into a fight that leads into a police station, law and order problem. Then it leads to, to uh, courts. If you look at the courts, majority of the cases are related to land ownership litigation. So if we can sort this out, we would be actually enabling people to live, a, 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 a give them freedom freedom of uh, surety of title and, and uh, rest them a bit. Otherwise, they are too worked up. It is like a black hole. The lack of clarity on title ownership transfer uh, is 
a sinky, it's become a sinkhole for energy of people. So it is taking government's time, it is taking people's time, it is taking the law and order agency's time, it is taking the court's time. All energies are getting sunk into this. So if we can sort it out, we can free up a, some of that energy into a more, more productive channel. Tell me, you know, how can land play a role in spurring a second stage growth for uh, Karnataka, the first right. stage growth yeah. was witnessed in the South Karnataka, yeah. the Mysore region, which is Bangalore. Yeah. Uh, you know, you talk about Karnataka, it's Bangalore, or, or maybe then, you know, in, the, yeah. in, in North India's right. imagination, it would be Kurg. Yeah. But there is something called Central Karnataka, yeah. there is something called uh, Bombay Karnataka, yeah. there is something called Hyderabad Karnataka. Yeah. What about that? What about that growth story? So majority of the rest of Karnataka is heavily dependent on agriculture, right? And uh, most of the human resource is still involved in agriculture. Their livelihoods are dependent on agriculture. Again, if you go with the traditional economic model of heavily dependent on primary sector, which is agriculture, even their surety of land, uh, proper maintenance of land records, will allow people to fully exploit the land resources. If the land records titles are not clear, farmers, instead of spending their energy on tilling the land, will be spending their time and energy in, uh, in a tehsil office, in the police station, in the uh, uh, civil court, it, which is a waste of their time and energy. This is the primary conventional economic approach. Now, let us say we want to move these areas uh, to the next level of growth, which is what you are talking about, uh, uh, you know, graduate to one step above agriculture. There again, though there is a lot of high-tech growth in Bangalore, which is mostly dependent on IT and science, technology, biotech and innovation and knowledge, but that is not enough to cater to the job demands of people. You need a bit of the secondary sector, which is manufacturing, service sector, processing, uh, you know, garments, such and such, which can generate a lot of, uh, you know, mid-level or low-level jobs. So that is again dependent on land resources, partly, not fully, but partly, because without land, you can't have a garment factory. Without land, you can't have any manufacturing facility uh, or a, a secondary processing uh, facility, right? So again, Land, though we want, you know, we have a romantic notion that farmers should remain in farming, but I think the farmers themselves want to move to something else. Uh, not all farmers can continue to do farming for eternity. They want their kids to move up into some other service sector job or a manufacturing job. So if we want other parts of Karnataka to develop, right, the Hyderabad Karnataka, which we now call Kalyana Karnataka, the Bombay Karnataka, which we uh, uh, call Kituru Karnataka now, and the Central Karnataka. So we can't take IT and high-end technology industries there. We have to move into manufacturing and uh, other, uh, you know, mid-level uh, 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 sectors. So that also depends on land resource management. And if there is surety of land resource management and title and so on and so forth, we can attract those investments there and unlock the, uh, uh, not just the land resource, but unlock, unlock the economic potential of people because they want jobs, they're ready to work. Are you, saying, need that, to are you saying that the Karnataka, other parts of Karnataka need to move into the manufacturing? IT has played its role in uh, Dakshin Karnataka. Yeah. Mysore, Karnataka, yeah. other centers need to create manufacturing hubs? I believe so because uh, la the governments over the last 20 years have tried to take IT to Mysore, have tried to take IT to Mangalore, have tried to take IT to Hubali and some of the private sector have played a proactive role in trying to take some of this you know, knowledge economy to other parts of Karnataka but we have not succeeded. So we have not succeeded despite our efforts and despite some support from the private sector. There are some Karnataka based uh, IT companies which set up large campuses in these other cities. But today, unfortunately, it pains me enormously, it saddens me. They have locked up those facilities because nobody is willing to go there and do IT job, right? Okay. So it depends on a social... Uh, you know, block, you yeah, know. It, it depends on social infrastructure which is available in Bangalore. 
right so there is a we have failed to take it growth there so what's the next alternative that doesn't mean that we we have to develop those regions and that has to come from manufacturing growth i believe i i i'm open to debate this i'm i'm open for correction on this while we try for you know knowledge economy to spread to other parts of karnataka but i need to focus manuf on fan manufacturing as a growth engine that can productively engage people in other parts of karnataka and and uh, i and karnataka cannot be dependent on just knowledge economy correct you can't be a one eye wonder you have to uh, broad base your foundation your foundation has to be strong it can't stand on one pillar i need other pillars i need service sector i need knowledge economy i need it but i also need manufacturing i need my uh, uh, you know hospitality sector to fire because jobs are generated by tourism the amount of job generation that happens in tourism is probably next only to garment sector right so tourism garments other sectors you know some sort of uh, i need small industries because small industries are the job generators not your 1000 crore investment ones they just take up lot of capital but they don't generate jobs so i need all these pillars for my economy to be broad based and my foundation to be strong in the long term if i am dependent on just one sector and something you know there is a disruptive change in that sector that leaves me highly vulnerable to future vagaries so broad basing is good from karnataka's point of okay. view okay you are talking about manufacturing you are talking about unfortunately you know uh, the knowledge industry often gets localized you yeah. know uh, it it doesn't spread all across yeah. i don't know what part of the culture doesn't permit it yeah. but somehow it gets localized so you are talking about ma uh, manufacturing but uh, how do you balance you know karnataka has shown that you know uh, a state can carry large number of uh, welfare schemes yeah. you know the five promises yeah. you came and this is a phenomena which is being witnessed throughout this country yeah. right now i don't want to get into the politics, politics. of politics yeah. of it but how do you how do you balance the imperative of this approach of manufacturing creation of assets yeah. unlocking the land yeah. with large scale uh, uh, schemes i shouldn't use the word pamper in context of poor but i must say uh, which which would keep them there yeah. without creating mobility of labor yeah so look right now centers like bengaluru are the only job creators in karnataka so centers like bengaluru are very few in karnataka so obviously it is encouraging migration people are flocking to these uh, growth centers and these growth centers are unable to man manage the human influx bangalore's uh, current residents are about 1.4 crores right bangalore you know you might blame the governments for inadequate infrastructure in bangalore but no Uh, uh nobody can keep up with this kind of population growth it's it's very impossible to keep up so we have to uh, you know if as you are saying if we want people to live in their original domicile then we have to take care of their economic aspirations they are struggling for jobs they are struggling for livelihoods one way of delivering some economic security to them is the basic minimum income so if we can deliver 4 5000 rupees a month and that you know enables them to meet the today's uh, challenges then people are able to manage with the current incomes along with the basic income that government so is providing to them so basically what you're saying is that you cannot decongest cities you have to decongest the services so if you decongest the services the people are going to go there but it has yeah. not happened uh, in bangalore in fact bangalore continues to be get, continues to get congested with everything coming here see the bangalore is not absorbing uh, uh, just karnataka's uh, migration if you look at actually data the migrant kannadiga migrants into bangalore are a very small population percentage of the population growth bengaluru is providing jobs for people from jharkhand from bihar from west bengal from uh, odisha from uh, uh, up and uh, rajasthan you name it bangalore is providing jobs for the whole of india so oh, 
right no i uh, no but this is the reality it is migrants are not just coming from karnataka so that is why bangalore is unable to uh, you know uh, provide adequate infrastructure because there is a influx happening from all over I think so i can't go into bihar and solve the problems of bihar sitting in karnataka i can take care of the people in other parts of karnataka but if there are inadequate services provided in some other state i don't want to name any state and hence people are migrating so i can't get into those states and ask them to stop they have people have a right to move it's a constitution given right of freedom to move so they are coming and we are welcoming them we are not pushing anybody away but you know i can i can provide services in the rest of karnataka but i can't provide services in the rest of india to prevent people from migrating to bangalore so uh, uh, to say that you know uh, 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 providing services in rural areas is uh, not a viable model based on what's happening in bangalore may not be appropriate is all my point is but then uh, but then what do you do with bangalore uh, if, if i uh, you know let me take this conversation to a different note when we talk about bangalore uh, there is a problem of connectivity you need to decongest the city then there is an environmental issues the lakes have disappeared i mean so the bangalore uh, is a living being in another living being in the sense that ba bangalore uh, is part of karnataka but it has a separate entity yes. you know bangalore has a separate manifesto yeah. parties came yeah. come out with separate manifesto yes. for bangalore yes. you know you don't have that for lucknow yeah. you know you you don't have that for uh, jaipur yeah. or uh, other yeah. uh, capitals yeah. but bangalore gets a separate manifesto it does and rightfully so and nothing uh, happens rightfully so uh, because bangalore has its own uh, existence now uh it has its own culture and it it has its own dynamics also it has its own problems and uh, often times uh, neglecting infrastructure like it was done during the previous government has a cascading effect because somebody comes subsequently and you have to catch up with that so nevertheless uh, you know point is that over the last 30 years since 91 particularly uh, bangalore is the growth of bangalore has always exceeded estimations okay right uh, you project for a 10% growth on a uh, annual basis or a decadal basis and it grows at twice or thrice that speed right at every stage um, future projections have fallen short to uh, uh, to the realities so here it is compounded the problems here but now i think there is enough understanding at least in our government that uh, you know we really need to uh, uh uh look at bangalore's problems even when we were there in the previous tenure you paid attention in between there is a uh, lack of focus uh, on bengaluru but now we have put the focus back on bengaluru uh, connectivity is a major issue and uh, we are looking at uh, increasing the services of public transport at the same time we are also looking at uh, you know catering to uh private transport as well because you we can't deny the right of people to private transport we are not like singapore which who can tax uh, you know uh, conge impose a congestion tax Absolutely. or you can you can put a high premium on ownership of car itself and parking uh on parking so we can't do that in a in a context and country like india so we have to uh provide infrastructure for private transport at the same time knowing very well that the solutions lie in public transport so we are looking at a rapid expansion of metro but moreover even below the metro we are looking at strengthening the bus transport which caters to even people at the lower level uh, and uh, with the introduction of a guarantee like shakti which has enabled women to travel freely in our buses the bus commuting has gone up uh, what does it mean it brings more revenue to uh transport government trans public transport companies so they will be instead of loss making enterprises that bus transport companies are going to become profit making entities so they can buy more buses they can upgrade their infrastructure they can increase the number of buses and also increase the reach of buses to more remote areas so if we can connect people with bus transport and metro public transport will greatly decongest a city like bangalore so we are working on this 
as well as expanding metro as well as uh, you know looking at uh, very uh, 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 out of the box solutions for private transport also. Okay, now let me come to the core question. How is Karnataka managing the imperatives of fiscal prudence with the schemes which are in operation? See, first off, uh, I don't know why the questions of fiscal prudence come up when you when only you look at the working class. Why is not the same question asked when you are doling out uh, you know tax rebate to the super rich in this country? The corporate income tax was reduced from 10 to 22 percent and further to 16 percent for the new corporates. Why didn't this question come up then? Mm -hmm. Every year two, two, 2 lakh crores are being written off as NPA for the super rich. Why is fiscal prudence not part of that debate? Between just these two concessions given to the super rich, 4 lakh crores are being lost to the country every year. So it's somehow only when you look at the human resource which is the working you know hands of the country suddenly fiscal prudence comes up now let me also uh, second point kerala tamil nadu have always adopted a welfare approach to uh, 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 you know uh, as an economic uh, model and uh, per capita income wise health index so human development index tamil nadu and kerala are on top so what is your point number 3 fiscal prudence there are three fiscal criteria. One is that the GDP, uh, uh, the uh, cumulative borrowing should be less than 25 percent, which we are maintaining in Karnataka. Uh, that uh, you know we should not uh, 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 exceed three percent of the borrowings per year, which we are maintaining. The only of the three, only one fiscal criteria that we are exceeding is that we are getting into a revenue borrowing, okay. which also from next year will not happen. So I think uh, this is a, a sort of a contempt for the condition of the working class this debate comes from. This debate comes from the top 20 percent who have little empathy for the remaining 80 percent in this country and the tax burden in this country has shifted towards the burden on to the working class who pay a greater share of the tax because the corporate income tax has been reduced and GST has been spread on a greater number of people. As a result, direct taxes which used to contribute 55 percent of Indian government's revenue have co had come down to 45 percent. Indirect taxes which were only 45 percent of our tax revenue had gone up to 55 percent. So, I think this debate is not based on facts or neither based on understa proper understanding. We will maintain fiscal prudence, we are capable of doing it and, and states which have gone the welfare road have done better. Economically they have done better, human development wise they have done better and this is a proven model. Do you think over a period of time center state relationships have improved? Or do they think that they have deteriorated? Is there is cooperative federalism under stress? <laughs> cooperative federalism exists in uh, rhetoric, and in reality, what we are facing is coercive uh, uh, federalism, where the centre dictates terms, and uh, 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 there is a, a rhetoric is uh, completely contradictory to reality. So, when you do really come up with cooperative federalism, we can talk about it. But uh, 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 rhetoric followed by contradictory uh, actions are not going to definitely help the federalism in this country. Krishna, before I let go of you, there are three questions. Uh, my first question is, you have seen Mr. Gandhi uh, in his earlier avatar from Bhatta Parsol trying to bring about the change. Do you think in the current avatar where Congress is supporting uh, India, do you think that this is a sort of a powerful organic alternative to what BJP stands for today because it has its hegemony, people in place, intellectual cosmos which is like out there right and an organization. Uh, I would not say uh, that uh, the alternative is perfect but uh, with uh, a set of parties coming together under the India Forum 
and uh, certain chemistry organically getting developed uh, between them. I think uh, we will be a viable alternative and I also think that people are uh, uh, itching for a change. Uh, uh, people are economically stressed in our country today and uh, you saw that in Karnataka elections, uh, uh, very few observers saw the groundswell against BJP and a lot of it has got to do with economic distress being suffered or by is people. Is there a Karnataka model of fighting elections? Something which did not come at four during Himachal, Congress won Himachal, yeah. but in Karnataka it electrified the cadre. We Karna in Karnataka, we acknowledged up front that in this country under BJP, the rich are getting super rich and the poor are struggling for a life. So we acknowledge that not in rhetoric, but in our policy. And that's what people have responded to. We have catered to 60% of the working class in this country. We have spoken of their pain and we have provided solutions for them. And uh, that is what we are implementing also. We are keeping our word uh, after coming to power. And I think walking the talk that we have done and recognizing the pain being suffered by people is a viable model uh, for the rest of the country. And I think this will find resonance at the national election also. And my last question to you is, uh, when you talk about alliance, a common minimum program. Uh, Sonia Gandhi was able to do that in 2004 and then in 2009. Right now you don't have a CMP and various segments are speaking in different voices. You had Sanatan Dharm controversy. Now you have a very strong Kaveri issue which has come up. Then you had the Savarkar issue. How, how do you deal with it? Because you know uh, Rahul Gandhi has consistently said that there has to be some sort of an ideological glue binding constituents together. There has to be a frame of thought. I, have, I want to quote from uh, 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 V.S. Naipaul, who described India as a million mutinies every day, right? India has always had million different voices. And you recognize them, you acknowledge them, you respect them. Don't try to impose one model on them. So that is the way to work by recognizing and respecting them and that's what congress believes in there is there are always competing voices and competing interests also within ourselves so we acknowledge it and we try to work through it and that's the only way you can bring harmony in in india we uh, we you may think it's rhetoric and you may disagree with it also but we believe in unity and diversity that india can inda ia can synthesize all this Yes, we have done it. That's what India is. India, Bharat is also synthesis of different cultures, but different voices. Bharat. India as a forum is also a synthesis of uh, different uh, political parties, which represent different interests, different cultures, different voices. And we will, we have, that's, that's the only way to keep India together that you work through your differences and build consensus and that's what we have done in up also and we will be successfully doing it under india also krishna thank you so much for being good time talking for to you Kar. thank you thank you krishna good talking to you china won't let us rest easy on our borders but they will keep flooding our markets. What does Xi Jinping?